Good afternoon, you all. So glad you're here. Welcome. This is a repeat of a lecture that Crystal and I gave back in April. Um, and we appreciate being asked to do it again. Um, you're looking at 60, over 60 years of recovery here on the floor, plus a lot of education about addiction and recovery, meaning medical science, social science, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to get started. Um, we'd love to have a big Q&A at the end, if you have a pencil and paper. Uh, and you have a question or one of the slides, you know, you want to go back to, just let us know. We're, we're really here to help. Uh, we love, we love not only our own recovery, but we love helping people in recovery. Let me introduce myself. I'm Scott Basinger. Um, I am partly retired. Uh, I had the pleasure of being the founding executive director of this institution. And I get a little choked up standing here um, because I get to be back in a place that I had a little bit to do with. So uh, my colleague um, is, was much, much smarter than me. She got sober much, much younger <laughs> and uh, is a Hope and Healing Center fellow here. Um, and I could not be prouder of her filling the, this fellowship here and the incredible amount of work she's doing. So uh, Crystal is widely known in the, in the education circles, in the schools. I'll let her say more about that, and I bet she will at the end. But um, before we get started, why don't you add to that, if you want? Thank you. I appreciate that. I, really, you said it all. I, I mean, I'm a researcher, a therapist, and I study high-risk behavior. I focus in on 18 different high-risk behaviors and do a lit review every year. And then I find out how those behaviors are affecting the brain and put it into prevention programming that I do a lot in schools. It's been a busy year thus year. I've, uh, last week, I did 17 presentations in schools. I know I was so sick of hearing myself talk. Like I didn't want to say anything for a whole weekend, which I didn't have to. But I'm, this is my favorite presentation, really, because it's kind of the meat and potatoes of everything that I study is the science of high-risk behavior and addiction. So I'll give it back over to my partner in crime, and you can start us off. So the, if there's a take-home from me, uh, it's recovery works. If there's another take-home from me is a major hallmark of addiction is denial, denial, denial. If you've got it in your family, if you're aware of somebody that you, in your family or that you work with or socialize with who has addiction, um, there are very effective tools for getting that people, getting that person to move from uh, the denial of it's really not that bad, I only drink on weekends or whatever, into the wonderful, incredible rewards of recovery. So hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions and leave you with a take home message. If you have children, um, and Crystal mentions her incredibly beautiful efforts on the part of really getting children educated about addiction and addiction behavior, um, you're going to see a slide that says the longer you delay your child in, ter in terms of adopting addictive behaviors, the less likely they are to have the problem that we grew up with and that we're now celebrating recovery for. So without further ado. So addiction is pathological. What does that mean? It has severe, it causes severe pathology. And that can mean <laughs> biochemical pathology, anatomical pathology, social pathology. It is really incredibly, incredibly destructive. Um, it destroys families, destroys workplace, uh, costs hundreds of thousands of lives a year. And we're going to speak not only specifically about addiction as it pertains to alcohol and drugs, but also to what we call process addictions. Addiction is compulsive. Um, every 
person who is engaging in addictive behavior will tell you when they get sober that when the, from the moment they woke up in the morning until the moment they went to sleep at night, they thought about when can I engage in my, in my addictive coping behavior? When can I get out to have a drink? When can I sneak off to the adult bookstore? When can I sneak away from my wife and open up the computer or whatever? And that compulsive behavior literally is, is increasingly present in the addict's mind. It's also destructive in terms to, of relationships. Um, it's a destructive relationship with a particular uh, substance thing or activity, meaning, in my case, alcohol and cocaine. Um, it literally took me from a pinnacle of a career in 1978, when I was at the top of a career, pen tenured professor at one of the local medical schools, and in 10 years, because I began to think that I really had the world by the, you know, what's, that I really had this thing down. And I thought, I really worked hard. I got my doctorate, and I've been here, and I've gotten a lot of grant money, and I do a lot of work, and I'm going to go out and have fun. Well, fun turned 10 years later to the day, literally, where I was homeless. I was living in my own foreclosed home. The sheriff was trying to lock me out, but I had a secret way of getting in. I couldn't pay the gas bill, which was $9 from, <clears throat> but I could find $300 to spend on a bag of cocaine. Um, I had a quarter of a million dollars in debt. I had seven arrest warrants out for me, and my job was hanging on a thread like this. I didn't walk into the rooms of AA. I didn't walk into a therapist's office and say, gee, I'm using a little too much cocaine. I came in through an intervention, but I, trust me, that I, I'm not minimizing how bad it was. And what I've told you is what you saw from the outside. I cannot tell you how personally destructive, fear-filling, and horrible being an addict in the heart of your addiction is. Psychologically and physically uh, habit-forming, we're going to talk about the physiology of the neurochemical systems in the brain. Uh, there used to be a joke in the early 70s about, oh, yeah, we do cocaine, but it's only psychologically addicting. Well, it is psychologically addicted and physiologically addicting as well. The culture of addiction. Ever since we began to walk upright, and probably before we began to walk upright, we have, at least primates, have always associated together in tribes. We have a need to be a part of a tribe. We have a need to be partnered. We have a need to be part of a fellowship, whether it's our family fellowship, whether it's our cultural fellowship, whether it's the guys who play golf in the morning, whether it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to be insensitive, whether it's the women who uh, have a book club together and women do golf and men do read books. <laughs> um, we really have a need to be with each other. Um, it's been studied for millennia, and we know it to be true. If our tribe is not safe, if I didn't feel comfortable in 1978 as the king of my laboratory at the local medical school, if I didn't sa feel safe, then I would not have gone out and looked for a new tribe, but I did. I started finding the happy hour tribe, and then I found the after happy hour tribe. And I found the 2 a.m. when the bar closes, let's go someplace else tribe. Um, and I was literally seeking to find a safe place where I felt comfortable. Why would somebody who is a professor at a medical school go into the dark side of Montrose to find his tribe? The reason was because I no longer felt comfortable in my tribe at in my academic institution. I knew I had a problem. Um, I was uh, increasingly um, not showing up for work. So there are two ways to build your self-esteem. One is to work on yourself and build self-esteem. The other way is to associate with lower and lower tribe members until you feel comfortable. Rituals create connection and safety. We all love rituals, and you all have them in your life. 
rituals around music, dress, music, language, dance, beliefs, food. Every, every stimulant addict who buys powder, if you pull out a credit card and go chop, 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 chop like this, they will immediately know what you're talking about. Because when you use cocaine, you pour it out on a mirror and you chop it up with a credit card or a razor blade. You make it as finely powdered as possible before you can inhale it. <clears throat> Drug cultural rituals are very powerful. Um, if you've ever watched any of the YouTube videos of people using methamphetamine or using crack or cooking opium in a spoon, drawing it up in a syringe, I mean, there literally is a worldwide ritual around using chemicals. That makes us feel more comfortable in the tribe because I've got the ritual, or I get to use the $20 bill rolled up when I snort my cocaine. And Bobby over here only uses a $5 bill. So. History of drugs. You'll notice that the Sumerians 7,000 years ago began to appreciate that when you chewed that gum on the top of the opium poppy, it caused a profound feeling of well-being. Um, the Egyptians began brewing um, fermented substances um, in 3,500 poppy seeds. Um, opium was widespread in China. You've all seen those pictures of the opium dens in, in China from literally thousands of years ago. We had, uh, we've had a number of periods in American history just since our founding. When alcohol became a real problem, you know about supposedly that General Grant was a horrible alcoholic and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, it, those efforts to limit our consumption of drugs and alcohol um, ended in with the failure of prohibition in the late 20s. Um, since then, we've had an onslaught and an ongoing wave of continued use of new substances as well as old uh, that make us feel good. And if it's not clear to you yet, the reason people use drugs, alcohol, or behavior is simply to feel better. Um, cocaine was a very powerful feel good. I could feel terribly afraid. Uh, worried that the, the next phone call was going to be from the sheriff, or that my chairman was going to call me and say, you're not doing your job. But if I would do a line of cocaine, instantly I felt good. Unfortunately, 30 minutes later, I had to do it again. Uh, right now, we're in an era where we live in a cocaine, crack, methamphetamine city. The opiate crisis is coming this way, sweeping from the East Coast. Um, the number of substances abused by our middle school, high school children, and of course the adult population, alcohol is still number one. But you've all heard about the drug fentanyl, which is now used to adulterate and contaminate um, most of the substances that are out there. It's a substance that's used in anesthesia. It's a very powerful pain reliever, and it's 100 times more powerful than, than opiates. So um, addictions are of two types, chemical addictions, alcohol, and drugs. We'll talk about the specific drugs. Uh, alcohol is still, what, about 20 to 1, mm -hmm. the big one. There are also process addictions. These are behaviors that make you feel better. And there are healthy ones working out, uh, working reasonably hard, um, going to a movie with your partner, uh, running, or bike riding. There are really wonderful, healthy behaviors that when you've had a bad day, um, taking a bike ride is a really healthy behavior. When you've had a bad day and downing a fifth of scotch is not. But the reason a person would engage in either one of those is literally to change the way they feel. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Gambling, sex, porn, food, internet, relationships, there's just a whole bunch of things that people use to feel better. Addiction, my definition, the one that certainly was true for me, it's an unhealthy coping behavior. 
uh, I used it to medicate my underlying dis-ease. As I grew increasingly in dis-ease, not comfortable with myself, not confident in myself, I needed a way to feel better. And instead of asking for help, um, I just went off on my own, found my new tribe in Montrose. Uh, I love to call it an outside solution for an inside job. And when you have a bad outside solution for an inside job that you're not dealing with, then that is the beginning of the addictive cycle. Um, most people are in, as I said, delusion and denial. Well, it's not really that bad. I only use on weekends. I don't really drink that much or whatever. Um, and, and of course, it gets worse and worse. OA, Overeaters Anonymous, has a wonderful saying, it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. And I truly believe that most addictive behaviors are a result of, of the inside job. That inside job could be maladaptive nurturing, it could be a genetic cause, could be both, could be some sort of childhood trauma. But I think for full recovery, not only do you have to stop using the substance and find a new tribe, such as a 12-step fellowship, you really have to have the courage to find a good therapist, a good sponsor, the 12 steps of AA, and go in and find out, where did I get broken? What happened? And can I face it today? Can I talk about it? Can I put it behind me? So I don't need to medicate that internal subconscious not good enough. So when we started looking at addiction and noticing the rates of substance use, and as people got into recovery from all different types of substances, we realized that what they all have in common is the release of dopamine. And we also know now that there are so many behaviors out there that also release this chemical. We're going to talk a lot about that. But that this can lead to unhealthy levels of these types of behaviors and what Scott calls cross addiction. So do you want to take this one? Yeah, cross addiction is something experienced by almost everyone who gives up their primary feel-good behavior. Um, it's not easy. Uh, there are obsessions and compulsions that continue. Um, you don't instantly turn from no self-esteem or low self-esteem to um, a narc almost a narcissistic level of I feel good, I'm king of the world. Um, my metaphor for this is the movie The Wizard of Oz. Uh, in, 19, in the 70s, I was increasingly presenting myself as the Wizard of Oz. I am the great and powerful Scott. What I really felt like increasingly was the little guy behind the curtain. And thank God Toto came along and pulled back the curtain and I got fully exposed. But immediately after that, I gained 30 pounds. My new adaptive behavior was bluebell ice cream. And I also got, I had a good addiction. I got addicted to AA. Uh, my first 365 days in, in recovery, I went to 434 meetings. I went to two retreats. I went to an international convention. But the point is, is that people in the process, the early stages of getting recovery, be, because they're feeling so uncomfortable, because they're in a state called anhedonia, which means no pleasure, they will find something else or they will relapse on their primary drug of choice. Um, the best examples are people who use cocaine, methamphetamine, crack, ice, the stimulants, ecstasy to a certain extent, have a high relapse rate on sex, sexual behavior, pornography, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people addicted in relationships, um, and there are, trust me, people who are addicted to another person and they have to break that addiction will often go um, behind the closed doors to places like porn. Alcohol people increasingly will go into their doctor and say, I can't sleep. I've been sober three weeks. Help me out. 
hoping that doctor will prescribe them a benzodiazepine, Xanax, Valium, um, clonazepam, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of them. I will tell you that the benzodiazepines are alcohol in a pill. So if you're getting sober or helping someone get sober from alcohol, please stay. I don't care if you have to stay up all night long. Please stay away from the benzodiazepines. Um, pain meds are particularly difficult. As we sit in the rooms of recovery, the number of people who got into recovery because they had a knee injury, because they're a high school football player, and they began using powerful opiates, Vicodin, Oxycontin, things like this. And because of the fact that their primary care physician didn't keep an eye on them, um, because they also probably at the time were hurt and injured, they were not performing like they were, they used those drugs initially for pain relief, which is okay, but eventually it became for emotional relief. And once you've crossed a certain line, which is different for everybody, um, you can't go back. There's a funny saying is, once you've gone from a cucumber to a pickle, you can't go back. So. You want to talk about the brain? I will, a lot, but you take this one. This um, well, this is your brain. This is your magic brain. This is your brain on a slide, not your brain on drugs. Um, there are, we're going to get into some very important areas in this, but um, you're going to see that the brain develops relatively slowly. It, uh, boys don't mature until 25 or so. <laughs> Young, maybe. Uh, <laughs> or 76 years old in my case. Um, <laughs> young women until uh, probably 20 or 21. Um, important areas here, um, I think we're going to cover a little more, but the bottom line is your frontal cortex and your prefrontal cortex, areas inside your flight and flight center called the amygdala, your memory center called the hippocampus, uh, and a whole bunch of, there's a big center of emotions in the brain. All of those are profoundly affected by using chemicals, medicating with chemicals, and all of them, when stimulated, eventually lead to this dopamine release that Crystal talked about. This is you, no? That's it. Okay, the central nervous system always con counteracts the stimulus with an opposite response in an effort to retain, take the brain back to homeostasis. The brain is a measuring device. It doesn't care about absolutes, but it cares about when stimulated, I want to return to a baseline. It's always looking for the baseline. And unfortunately for addicts, that baseline level gets fed by the drugs of choice that they're using. So when you think of your brain and you think of your brain as you go through the day, when you've had a joyful experience, you get that wonderful feeling of, of boy, I really did a good job today. I had a wonderful intimate experience with my partner. But your brain resets, and it basically resets back to a homeostatic level, and it Sadly, it wants more, it, and we're going to see how much more it wants. Uh, addicts will tell you that the very first time they did their primary drug of choice, they had an incredible experience, often described as a religious experience. I remember, I will never forget my first experience with cocaine. When I used cocaine, it was in a social setting with a bunch of high-end people that I wanted to be part of. I was looking for a high-end tribe. Um, the first two things in my mind was, oh my God, who brought this? And how can I make them my best friend? And where can I get more? I always need a Cocaine Anonymous meeting after I do a presentation <laughs> with Scott. <laughs> my mouth is like watering, as cocaine was my drug of choice as well. And in order to talk about homeostatic balance, we really need to look at this awesome part of the brain located deep inside those myelinated lobes, really well protected, thank goodness, because this is a critical part of our brain for survival. A lot of you guys have probably heard of the limbic system. The amygdala is right there, our hippocampus, and all of the other little teeny tiny organelles that work together 
to produce the fight or flight or freeze response. But this is also where all pleasurable experiences begin and end. And it's always important to remember that this part of the brain is a reactor, not a thinker. The thinker is the prefrontal right. cortex or the frontal lobes. So we're gonna focus for the next few slides on pleasure and what happens when we tip the scales of homeostatic balance. Now, um, this is yours, but I'll go ahead and play through if that's okay, Scott. So I think this is important to remember that there are a lot of different neurochemicals that are involved in the addictive process. And each particular drug actually targets very specific receptor sites, hormones, or neurotransmitters. But what they all have in common is that they either increase or decrease dopamine levels within our system. So dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter that governs reward or salience. So your limbic system is constantly looking in your environment, monitoring it for what's bad for you and what's good for you. And when it spots something that's good for your survival, it is salient. It gives you a reward for engaging in that behavior. A great example is you know what you feel like if you haven't eaten for about six, seven, eight hours? What kind of feelings do you get? Restless, irritable, and discontent. <laughs> Most people go hangry. I get hangry. Hangry, right? yes. yes. Hangry, moody, irritable, tunnel vision, fatigue. What your limbic system is doing is it's depleting itself of dopamine. It's saying, hey, you need to go do something good for my survival. And until you do, I'm gonna make you feel really uncomfortable. As soon as you eat, you get about a 100% increase in dopamine. Your limbic system says, hey, you just did something good for my survival, here's your reward. Feel calm and happy. There's another human behavior that schools make me say when you're married and protected, right? <laughs> When we engage in sexual behavior, we get a, a dopamine increase of 150%. So scientists believe that this behavior is good for your survival and your species survival. So that's why they think that it increases dopamine levels more. And if you guys think about that, like this is a normal, this is like a normal date night right there, right? <laughs> it's what we do as humans. Good things for our survival. When we introduce substances that spike dopamine levels too high, like cocaine, somebody snorts a line of cocaine, they get a dopamine increase of about 350%. Methamphetamine, very similar amount, 1,100%. Heroin is speculated to increase dopamine levels by 1,300%. When I read that study, I went into this presentation and I tried to put it in here and you couldn't see food or sex anymore. And I thought, that is what happens when somebody gets addicted to opioids or heroin, what's one of the first things they stop doing? Eating, having healthy relationships. So here's what's happening in your limbic system. It's just a reactor. It does this simple mathematical calculation. Your limbic system's basically thinking, hey, when you put this in my body, I get 250% more dopamine than when you put this in my body. So that must mean this is 250% better for my survival than this. So remember, the limbic system is just a reactor. It is lit up with dopamine. Unfortunately, when that happens, our frontal lobe goes dark. It sends all the electrical activity into our limbic system to process all of those neuroreceptor sites or neurotransmitters, and it literally doesn't think anymore. So we have a threshold for dopamine. Our body is able to produce about up to 200% the amount it has at baseline. And so your hedonic threshold is normally about that line. Now, it is normal to go up and down with dopamine all day long within this threshold. You uh, get hungry, it plummets, you eat, it goes back down. You get bored, you get lonely, you connect with friends, you go exercise. I learned that eye contact and smiling give you huge increases of dopamine. 
One of the reasons that scientists believe our generation Z, our younger generation, has more depression and anxiety than any other generation that came before them is because they get, on average, two hours less human contact than Generation Xers did. They're not getting it. Where, where is their face to FaceTime? In technology, right? So it's quite normal to be within this threshold. But here's the danger. When we go above this threshold, two structural changes occur in our brain. So the first one, if we travel deep inside the limbic system and look at the neurotransmitters that are increasing dopamine when we're using substances, you can see the dendrite, the receptor sites, and the dopamine coming across the synapse. When we tax the system and ask it to produce way too much dopamine, we literally damage those neurons and their ability to produce the same amount of dopamine. This is why as high as a drug will take you, it take, takes you equally where? As low. Now the good news is that your brain heals from that. It can bounce back and after stabilization, your body starts to return to the same level of production of dopamine that it started off in. But the sex second structural change is not something we can bounce back from. When we flood the synapses with so much dopamine, your brain literally learns, I've got to grow more dendrites and more and more receptor sites to handle this influx of dopamine that's coming in. More and more receptor sites for dopamine. Then, when all of the dopamine leaves your system with the drug, you have all these new structures, those new receptor sites, and they are doing what? Looking. Screaming for more. Screaming for more. I love this little video clip because it shows you the process of tolerance building. As you increase the amount of dopamine, literally your brain learns to handle the influx. But then, it's got way too many receptors for dopamine, which leaves you constantly in a state of withdrawal and craving. And each drug has different types of withdrawal symptoms. They may look very differently in early stage withdrawal as opposed to latter stage as well. Now that is the hedonic threshold for most of us. But let me ask you, by show of hands, who in here has a genetic history somewhere in their family of addiction? Okay, almost all of us. No, what I normally get is about 20% of the audience, because it really is about one in four, one in five people have somewhere in their genetic line. If you do, you may process differently, dopamine a lot differently, and that will not be your hedonic thresholds. Your hedonic thresholds may be that line. The reason it is this line is because of something that geneticists have called reward deficiency syndrome. What this postulates is that genetically, we actually process, store, or synthesize less dopamine than other people do, which means your threshold for dopamine is much lower. So I'm gonna tell a story about a client that really illustrates this. Kiddo came to see me a few years ago and she walked in and said, oh my gosh, you're the brain lady. Like, I know you. You came to my middle school and did a good presentation about substances. I quit smoking pot for like a whole month. <laughs> like, oh great, but what happened? And she said, well, I live with my grandparents and they're kind of old and they, you know, they don't watch me very well. So I snuck out a lot. But she said, check this out. When I got to high school, my BFF and I came up with a safety plan. If we would go to parties, we would drink equal the same amount. If she drank this much, I drank this much. If she took one pill, I took one pill. If she took one hit, I took one hit. <laughs> I'm thinking, safety plan? <laughs> but her brain's not fully developed yet, right? So we got to go with it. And she said, but really, in the end, it didn't work out for me. I started like drinking more and sneaking behind her back. I got into more trouble. She never did. Sometimes she didn't even want to drink and she'd like put water in her red solo cup. Oh my God, she's, can you believe that, right? <coughs> really cute. So 
Uh, my first question for this beautiful young lady is what? Genetics. Do you have in your family tree? And she's like, well, duh. Both my parents, parents lost custody of her and were institutionalized for heroin addiction. She had it both first degree relatives. Her genetic risk was really high, unfortunately. And what that means is that even though they spike dopamine, her and her BFF spike at the exact same amount, all she has to do is spike to that threshold and her body starts making those structural changes sooner. And we see this a lot with young adults who are failing out of school because of drug and alcohol. They always will say, I was using the same amount as everybody else. I don't know why I got into so much trouble compared to them. My first question again, is it, do you have it in your family history? Because you just have to spike your dopamine level to there to start making those structural changes. Okay, do you wanna say anything before we go on? Scott? Nope, okay. right on. Good? All right. So let's talk about RDS, Reward Deficiency Syndrome. This term was coined in 1996 by a geneticist named Dr. Kenneth Blum, who spent a great deal of his career at the University of Texas in Austin. His company actually is in San Antonio, Texas, but I didn't read that article until probably about 2010, I think. It was kind of a spiritual moment for me. Now, this is a genetic uh, researcher, which is one of the reasons that we don't hear a lot about this, because a lot of times addiction researchers and genetic researchers publish in completely different journals and unfortunately don't talk a lot to each other. But RDS is really um, uh, the name that represents behaviors found to have gene-based associations with hypodopaminergic Function. So everybody say hypodopaminergic five times really fast, right? I know that's all. <laughs> so let's break that down. Hypo, a scientific prefix meaning lower or decreased, and therefore hypodopaminergic state is a condition where dopamine is either decreased in amount or not functioning properly. And so we know that there are over 1,600 addiction-related genes. Not just one gene, 1,600 different addiction-related genes on 21 different molecular pathways within our uh, sequences that are related to how different <coughs> neurotransmitters that function in addiction work. And so what we know is that like we said earlier, there are a lot of different um, receptor sites, receptors or neurotransmitters or hormones in what we call the reward cascade. But we know that they all terminate in either an increase and decrease of dopamine. So this is called the reward cascade. And what RDS tells us is that there are certain genes in, in those 1600 <coughs> that have morphed a little bit. And what that means is that there is an irregular gene expression caused by those genes that have polymorphisms included. So a gene polymorphism causes an imbalance in this reward circuitry. So uh, we know that it can happen with serotonin, it can happen with mu opioid, GABA, or dopamine. Basically, you have a gene that tells your body how much of that neurotransmitter hormone or um, uh, a, a, a particular brain chemical to make. And if you have RDS, basically what that means is that you make or synthesize or process a little bit less dopamine than other people. This is yours. One of the first questions I ask, and I'm sure Crystal does too, when I'm asked to work with somebody who's in an addictive cycle is, What's your family history? It's incredibly important. Uh, we know that young men from alcoholic fathers have literally hundreds of times greater chance of, be, of abusing chemicals and becoming alcoholics. Whoops. So <clears throat> people over the years have tried to figure out a single model for addiction. I'll ignore the one at the top, but the one at the top says, basically, I have a genetic tendency to this. 
It has changed my brain. Because of exactly what Crystal was talking about, it changes my behavior, and therefore I ended up, ended up in an addictive state. That's very real um, and certainly true for many, many people who get into addiction. Um, the other model is what we call the psychosocial model, which says, and we'll talk about something called ACE, Adverse Childhood Experience, but it says that somewhere growing up, things, didn't, things weren't so good for me. It could have been a single traumatic event. It could have been the, the state I was living in. It could have been virtually anything. And that childhood wound increased pain in me. Um, that pain made me adapt to finding ways to relieve that pain, uh, changed my behavior, changed my brain, and um, therefore I ended up in addiction. Here are some ACE, adverse childhood experiences. These are what I called, when I said addiction is an outside solution for an inside job, these are the inside jobs that we can look at as recovering people. What happened to me as a child? My inside job was shortly after I was born, my father left for two complete years. And my mother, who was an addict and very depressed, so I had, a, I had an adverse childhood experience literally before I became three or four years old. Um, I won't go through these. Some of them appear mild. Some of them are horrific in terms of um, near relative or parental sexual abuse is, is horrible. Um, and, but the bottom line is part of recovery is exploring in the recovering person what went wrong. Let's talk about it. It's over. Um, we, there are tools we can use to, to quote of, to sort of put it aside or so I, I don't have to continually medicate it. So what we know is that we all have a genetic code. They call that our genotype. You add that to what's going on in our environment, and what you get is something that scientists call a phenotype. And so for us, usually, when I say us, recovering addicts and alcoholics, what you see in very common that we have the genes at various levels, but also in an environment we may suffer from growing up with abuse or uh, negative environments, any kind of type of neglect, which we see more of today, unfortunately, because of parental technology use, childhood sexual abuse or physical abuse, as well as parents who grow up and also have struggle with their own addictions, which could potentially lead to a phenotype that is potentially somebody who becomes addicted. Now it's interesting because I've actually worked with a lot of people over the years who had similar environmental issues, may also have had the genes, but were able to have healthy attachments to at least one person who was able to provide a secure attached environment for that person and was able to get them into an environment that was very dopamine rich in a healthy way and actually changed what their phenotype looked like. But if you have RDS, which would be what I think is really addictive personality. So you guys, it's a pet peeve of mine to hear people say that, especially about their kids. I hear parents say, oh, that one, he's got an addictive personality. And to me, there's such a stigma with kind of personality issues and disorders. I don't really think it's their personality, but their genes are actually compelling them forward to seek more dopamine, more sensation-seeking experiences, because they actually don't make enough of that on their own. And that may manifest in a lot of different ways. They may be very sensation or novelty-seeking. They could have a lot of anxiety or depression, or restless, irritable, discontented, angry, anxious, or low self-esteem, which totally described me once I hit puberty. I remember feeling uncomfortable in my own skin right at about the age of 11, 12, when most likely my genetics had kicked in. And also growing up with a single mom who had mental health issues, there was my phenotype, right, with her plus my genes. And so I, 
Well, the first time I ever drank alcohol, I remember thinking to myself, why hasn't my mother told me about this? <laughs> like, this totally took away my anxiety. You know, isn't that interesting that I had that thought at 12? So I felt this way and still feel this way sometimes in life. And so I'm reading the RDS article, you know, that really seminal paper. There's all these big genetic words, and I'm having to Google them as I'm reading this. And then all of a sudden, there's a little paragraph that says, if a patient has RDS, this is how it may manifest. And it literally listed these. And like I said, I had a spiritual experience. I started to cry, and I thought, oh my god, it's not me. Well, it's my genetics. <laughs> but it's not me as a spiritual person. Like, I'm not defective and damaged, which I always thought I was. Like, something is wrong. And now that I know that my genes just don't tell my brain to make the right levels of neurotransmitters. Okay, so a little bit more about, I love cats too, so I loved this picture, right? <laughs> so uh, if you particularly have this polymorphism, it is related to a much higher level. And guess who has that polymorphism? Yep, me, I have it. So I'm gonna share with you how you can get genetically tested or test your kids. But what I understood from the genetics is that if you have like a distant, distant relative, a great grandfather, mother, or past that, that has addiction, your chances may be around the 30th to 40th percentile. Then we need to add in the right environment to get the phenotype of alcoholism or drug addiction. But if you have it in a first degree relative, so my dad died of addiction and homelessness, and my uh, mother's two brothers both have alcoholism. The youngest one died of cirrhosis. So that's how close it is in my genetic family tree. The closer it is, the higher your risk. And if you have two first degree relatives or one first degree relative, your risk can go up to as high as 74.4% chance of having addiction. Unfortunately, Fred's addiction was totally out of control. <laughs> And so our normal levels of dopamine make us feel this sense of well-being, this calm, pleasure, a reduction in stress. And if we have low levels of dopamine, it can lead to craving, sensation-seeking, inability to cope with stress, predisposed to seek substances as a pseudo-sense of well-being or an inside job. Say that the saying again? Outside solution for an inside job. There we go. Yeah. And here's what it looks like when we're healing. So remember I said that the frontal lobe really shuts off. This is really an obvious study that shows this. This is a slice of the brain going this way, and we're looking from the top down. This person is, has no drugs or alcohol in their system. And here's a cocaine abuser about 10 days sober. Interestingly, this is also what it looks like when you're high or detoxing. Your limbic system, which is right back here, is lit up full of dopamine. And the rest of your brain, specifically your prefrontal cortex, is funneling all that energy into the limbic system. If you think about a good example of this is, how do you, anybody in here overeat on Thanksgiving? Okay, a few of you are, I think, honest. Yes, we all, right. What do you feel like doing after you overeat on Thanksgiving? Nap. Napping, Nap. right? Watching TV. Do you Nap. want to do deep, complex problem solving and decision making? Or have empathic conversations with someone? No, because your frontal lobe is literally off. You're in what we affectionately term the food coma, which is basically that your limbic system is full of dopamine and your frontal lobes are shut off because all that electrical activity is moved to the back of the brain to process all of that dopamine. But when it's too high from drugs and alcohol, this is what we see. And you can see this person about over 90 days, like three months is our 90-day mark, 100 days sober, and we've only got about 50% of the frontal lobes that are back on. It takes about 18 months for this person to return to this level of functioning. And if it's opioids, or methamphetamine, it could take up to four to five years. Cheers. Four to five years of being, living in this brain state while you're trying to get sober and stable. Now, if that is you, 
whether or not you're actively using or detoxing, if your frontal lobe is off, this is what you might look like. Doctors call it acquired narcissism. In the program, my sponsor just said I was acting like an asshole. <laughs> but when our frontal lobes are off, this is what we look like. It's the frontal lobe that can attune to other people. It's interesting, there was a beautiful study done on young mothers while they were looking at pictures of their infant children, and it was the frontal lobe that lit up like a Christmas tree. Another study done on devoutly religious people while they were praying, the frontal lobe lights up. This is where our connection to others, to our higher power, to our pets, our animals, lives. And when we don't have that part of the brain, we can't attune to other people. Okay, well, rounding toward the end here. Oh, I've got two slides and then you finish out, actually. So uh, Dr. Blum, and please know that I don't get, I don't have any financial affiliation with Dr. Blum's uh, company, but it's called Genus Health, and you can get an addiction risk score profile. They just send you a swab and you put it in your mouth and send it back, and they will tell you out of the 1,600 different genes associated with addiction, pretty much how many of those you have and what category, low, medium, or high risk, you are with a variety of different uh, behaviors. And so this is the website where you can get it. It's actually decreased. I said what was your GAR score? My GAR, it was um, a 12. My GAR score is a seven. There you go, okay. Yeah. So, oh no, okay, I think I'm, my combination, because I was right about a seven or an eight, and then plus the addiction one, which is a five. That, right. So the combined was a 12. But, it's interesting because as more people um, take it, we get to see how right. many more people have that many. And so these are all the different things that the GAR score will show you. What I love about this is I've used this with clients of mine who have kids. So they're in recovery and their kids are growing up and they're worried. Am I gonna pass along my genes to my kids? Well, this can validate whether you are or not, but it also shows you some of the co-occurring issues that your child may genetically be predisposed for. Then you can create a tailored prevention and treatment program specifically for your kiddos. The last thing I'll say too is that what I really loved about this is that this particular company sells a natural supplement and they devise a natural supplement formula for you of things that naturally help you increase dopamine levels. So I had already done some research on this, and I learned that folic acid was something that actually helped your body increase dopamine. And so I started taking methylfolate, and then after a few months, I forgot my um, bottle. I, I didn't buy any more, and so I just said, you know what, I don't think I'm feeling much. I'm not going to take this anymore. And after about two weeks, I noticed this kind of blue feeling just kind of creeping back in, feeling a little uncomfortable again. And I thought, oh my God, duh. I took this supplement that actually brought some of my dopamine levels up to kind of baseline. Because usually I'm functioning much lower than that. And so I started taking it again. Of course, an addict would want an immediate like response. Yeah. Exactly. And since I just felt normal, how fun is that? Not very much. But it was a, a really good moment for me to understand that I really have to take good care of my body and the neurotransmitters in my brain so that I can maintain healthy uh, self-esteem and emotion regulation, frontal lobe skills, so that I maintain recovery. Speaking of recovery. Yeah, and I want to just go back real quick. Sure. I want you to look at the face of this little boy. Mommy and daddy are arguing. I guarantee you that child feels a couple of things. If I were a better child, Mommy and Daddy wouldn't be fighting. What's wrong with me that they're fighting? And he is being ignored, and he is scared, and that is setting him up for joining us in the rooms. <laughs> look at the plaintive look on this little girl's face. Mommy, please pay attention to me. Please pay attention to me. So her self-worth which is Brene Brown says, if you can get a child through fifth grade with self-esteem and self-worth, you've done your work. 
The truth is, as parents, we've got to go through another stage with our children called individuation, or they'll be living in our basement the rest of our lives. <laughs> Look at the trauma look uh, on this young woman's face. Um, children of alcoholics are just set up for this, for, for this disease and hopefully set up for recovery. So let's go to recovery. So recovery works. Yeah, y'all ought to. Back, back, back. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, so I told you I went to 434 meetings my first 365 days. I found a new tribe. And that tribe didn't judge me. That tribe wasn't my academic colleagues. Um, that tribe accepted me in a non judgmental way, most of them. Um, and that was a tremendous boost to my recovery. At the same time, I'm in therapy. I'm exploring my inside job. Um, I went to a therapist who had us write a story. Tell us a story from your childhood. And I remembered being about eight years old, and my parents went out every Wednesday night and every Saturday night. And we always had a babysitter named Mrs. Varner. Well, one Wednesday night or Saturday night, I don't know which, my father was backing the car out of the, the driveway, back it out, turn this way, and drive in front of our house. I would stand at the door of the front of the house and watch them drive away. On this particular evening, I tore myself away from Mrs. Varner. I ran to the curb and began to chase the car as it was going down the street knocking on the window of the car, <clears throat> crying, just decompensating, slinging snot all over the win window. When, the, <clears throat> when my father stopped the car, my mother rolled down the window. <clears throat> she said, what's wrong? And I said, would you bring me a Hershey bar? I was so insecure at eight years old that I was afraid that when they drove away, they weren't coming back. Now, that the fact that I made it to age 44 before I started inhaling cocaine is amazing. And Hershey so, bars. Yeah. <laughs> and so I explored that deeply and richly in, in group and individual therapy. I love group therapy. I love individual therapy. Um, sometimes I actually go back to my therapist. Service work. <clears throat> One of the ways you build your self-esteem <clears throat> is by helping others. And there's a saying in AA, <clears throat> you have to give it away to keep it. So all of us have sponsors, and all of our sponsors, when you call up and say, I feel like crap, they don't say, oh, I'm so sorry. Have a blue bill. They say, go work with a new addict and go to a hospital meeting. Prayer and meditation. I cannot overemphasize or the, the need to connect with whatever your version of a higher power is. I cannot emphasize that. The spiritual gift of recovery comes with um, what we call taking the bridge from being powerless to the steps that find us a new higher power. Um, that higher power is totally up to the addict, recovering addict's choice. But spirituality, realizing that I'm, I'm not the Wizard of Oz, and I'm also not the little guy behind the curtain, that I have value, that I'm respected in my new tribe, and in fact, now respected back in my old tribe. So again, recovery works, and we're exactly an hour. We're gonna stop and answer questions. Um, I cannot emphasize what an amazing therapist, counselor, educator, magical woman this my partner is here so uh if you have kids if you have kids at school where she's not speaking uh as a fellow here at the hhci it's her job to, to answer <laughs> all your stuff and a shameless plug is that i'm also writing a book which is why i'm doing here as a fellow 
It's called the Neural Whereabouts Guide, and it's all about how your child's brain develops and how different high-risk behavior affect it, what high-risk behaviors crop up when elementary, middle, and high school, scripts, activities, all kinds of things that prevention science says. So if you'd like to be on the list to know when it's published, it'll be in the spring. It's about 90% done. Please, please feel free to do that. Mm -hmm.